My name is Leo Shoemaker for Adventures with Leo Shoemaker. I'm here with Jack Springle at the CB Museum in Davisville, the first place they had CBs uh, working. Jack, how long have you been in the service? I served uh, for 20 years active duty. And I started in uh, Port Wanimi, well actually started basic training in Great Lakes, Illinois, then went to Port Wanimi, California for my A school, and then uh, Iceland, a couple tours in Iceland, and Tig of the West Indies. Uh -huh. Um, then I was an instructor at Gulfport, uh, Mississippi for a construction electrician A school. Then uh, I was selected for presidential support duty at Camp David and I worked under President Reagan. Then I went to Great Britain at uh, NAFAC Brody Wales and there I put in uh, for a commission was selected to become a chief warrant officer. Came here to Davisville in 1989 as the construction equipment officer. And then we got the notification uh, for the first Gulf War, so we activated all the pre-position war reserve stock that was here. Sent that down to Gulfport and uh, California to backfill stuff that they had already shipped to the first Gulf War. Mm. And then I became the public works officer, closing up the building and more falling the facility, and then we closed the base in 1994. It opened in 1942, correct? Correct, correct. Now, who came here first? I mean, there was, constr there was civilian construction workers for the seat for the Navy, but they didn't work out because if they were caught, they were considered guerrillas. Correct. So that that that's what happened during the Second World War. But right. who came here first? Uh, so it's quite a unique story. Captain Raymond V. Miller was the public works officer who was stationed over at Newport. He was given the orders by Admiral Ben Morrell to come across the bay over here to build this facility. And why did that happen? That happened because President Roosevelt entered into the Lend Lease program for Great Britain. So they needed to find a location that was out of the congested areas of the busy ports of New York and Boston and down the south in Norfolk, Virginia. And that. So it was only natural that they looked along the eastern seaboard and they found Narragansett Bay, which was a naturally protected bay because of the configuration of the state of Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. So coming up Narragansett Bay, they found what was Quonset Point. So they came in and they acquired some of the property here through eminent domain and they ended up owning 3,500 acres as they started building facilities here. So the first facility they built was the Advanced Base Depot, and that was to stage all of the Lend-Lease material to go to Great Britain. Mm -hmm. And the other uh, advantage of being here was two days sailing time quicker to get to England from here. I didn't know that. Yes. Oh. And there were two civilian contractors that were awarded here. It was uh, George A. Fuller and Merritt Chapman Scott were the two civilian contractors that were awarded to work to start construction here. Mm -hmm. all right. And just as a side note, Captain Miller brought in all of the construction here under budget and ahead of schedule. Just like all CBs do, right? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's fun being here and hearing all the history of the CB Museum because it's really important to come over and see it. Now there's a, a museum in Port Wainami in the Gulfport, but this is the original base. Now, how many people were here in World War II? There were over 100,000 men that were trained here during the Second World War. And there were over 320 uh, CBs during the Second World War. Mm -hmm. So we trained quite a few during the Second World War. Um, and everybody saw the Fighting CBs movie, right? <laughs> Wanted yes. to be a CB. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> so you can remember, I don't know if you did during your time, but during my time, and you know, every quarter we'd all go to the club and watch the John Wayne movie for a morale booster, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now well, let's talk a little about the CB here. Yes. It was designed by I afraid. I afraid. So now I have another whole story for you. Yeah, tell me. Okay. So while the base was being built during the Second World War, there was a civilian guy that worked in the plan file room here that has all the blueprints and all that. His name was Frank J. I afraid. He was known as a cartoon character type artist. So the young officer that was here training the first group of pre CBs that were learning how to put up Quonset huts. This young officer approached Mr. Iafrey and said, I need you to help me construct or draw or draft up some kind of a cartoon type character to help me recruit people for this new Navy construction work. So Mr. Iafrey said, okay, no problem. So he went home that weekend, and Frank Iafrey, by the way, is a, is a native Rhode Islander from North Providence. And I, oh, had, I, didn't know that. And I had the pleasure of getting to know him. Uh -huh. okay? We have his uniform on display and some of the artifacts that the family donated to the museum. So Mr. Iafredi goes home that weekend, goes to the, the library, his local library, and he's in there going through all the books and he's trying to figure out, well, what kind of a creature can I come up with? So the local librarian goes, well, Frank, what are you working on? And she tells him, and I'm repeating the same exact story that Mr. Iafredi told me. So he goes, well, I'm trying to come up with this character for this new Navy unit. 
So we think, well, you know, what's very industrious and, and builds things, but also is associated with the water. So what's the first thing everybody thinks of? That builds something in the water. A beaver. Oh. Right? I didn't know that. Right? A beaver, right. yeah. Right. 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 So what, hap what, happens, what happens when you approach a beaver? Slaps his tail. And swims away. Yeah. So we couldn't become the fighting beavers, could we? No, no, no. Uh -huh. no. <laughs> <laughs> So the next thing he's thinking about, okay, what other type of creatures, very, very industrious, always busy, always working, and when you mess with them, they pack a punch. The bee. Okay. So he draws the bee. He puts the sailor hat on top of it to make it look neat. He puts the tools in all the hands of the bee and the, and the Tommy gun in the front. Okay, so that shows that it'll pack a wallop. So Frank draws that all up, and the first drawing has the letter Q around it, which stood for Quonset. Mm -hmm. So that gets sent to Washington, D.C., Admiral Morale takes a look at that. They send a letter back to Frank, ask him, please take the letter Q off of it, put a big piece of navy line around the outside of it, a rope, to make it look more generic than navy. Which he does, submits it back to them, and they take it. And they accept it, and they say, that's great. And we have a copy of the letter from Admiral Ben Morale that goes back to Frank accepting the drawing. The father of the CB. Yes, Admiral, 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 yeah. Admiral Ben Morale, yes. So, what happens now is, now, but they don't have a name. So this new motor unit is called Construction Battalions. So if you take the first letter from Construction, which is C, and the first letter from Battalion, which is B, that becomes CBs. That's how we get our name. Okay. So we have that whole write-up. We have Frank's first drawing here on display, and we have Frank's uniforms here. Now, just to, to go back for a minute, you mentioned something about the John Wayne movie. Yes. Well, the number two man under Ben Morrell was Rear Admiral Lewis B. Coombs. Mm -hmm. We have his uniform here on display also. Louis B. Coombs was the technical advisor to the John Wayne and the Fighting CD movie. I didn't know that. Okay. I'll be there. And we actually have <coughs> a couple photographs in the, the cabinet on display with the, the Admiral and John Wayne uh -huh. together as they were working on the movie. And it goes on that they became friends for the rest of their lives or they were still alive. So it's just a lot of unique items we have in our own little museum here. It's a beautiful little, little museum. It's Thank a you. Kwanzaa hut, too. <laughs> yes. Now, yes. Let me check one second. Make sure everything's on, okay? That's on. That's on, okay. Now, the Kwanzaa hut, what is a Kwanzaa hut? Okay, that's another story we give for the museum here. Okay. So, what happens during World War II is that while the construction is going on, Captain Miller has a set of plans that they brought back from England during the First World War called the British Nissen hut. He takes these plans and he gives them to the George A. Fuller Company. He says, I need you to take these plans and make some improvements on them, and I need you to bring this back to me within 30 days. So George A. Fuller takes those plans, makes the changes to it, brings them back to Captain Miller ahead of schedule. So now they start developing and manufacturing the Quonset huts here. The first huts are made out of uh, arches with about a quarter inch thick steel, and they're shaped like a T. Mm -hmm. and the ends of the hut kind of hook on with eye hooks that hold the ends of the hut on and the rest of it's all held together with wooden purlings down the side so it's very heavy. So that's the first model hut. It's 16 feet wide by 36 feet long. Okay, so us six-footers are kind of tough. Get a little bit of hunchback trying to stand in there. So it's completely semicircular. Mm -hmm. So as that's going on, Captain Miller is given credit for naming them Quonset huts after the base he's building at Quonset Point because he doesn't want to have copyright infringements with Great Britain and the Nissan Huts. So that's how they get their name, Quonset Huts. So there are multiple evolutions of the designs. Mm -hmm. The second hut now goes to a new shaped um, sheet metal channel type arch, mm -hmm. which is a lot lighter. Yes. And instead of being semicircular, now they go to a four foot vertical knee wall and then a semicircular top. Mm -hmm. And it's still 16 by 36 feet. The third design is now 20 by 40 but it now still has the four-foot vertical knee wall and the curved top. Mm -hmm. And then now the third generation of hut is completely semicircular because they realize now with 20 by 40 feet, which is the new dimension, you don't have to have the knee wall on it because with being 20 feet wide, there's plenty of room to stand up at the side of the hut. And then the final hut is still 20 by 40, but they take the corrugation, they put it on horizontally, so you don't have to have a bend or a curvature in the corrugation. Hmm. Okay. So these are all the evolutions. And we have all of those huts on display outside, except for the first model hut, which we do have a complete hut, but it's in storage. We just haven't put one together yet. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, it would take eight men one day to completely assemble a hut. There were 83 interior floor plans for these huts. 
So one hut could be a barracks, the dentist's office, the doctor's office, the cobbler's shop, uh, the bakery, um, you name it, the chow hall, everything, uh, you name yeah. it. There was also a larger one called an elephant hut, which was 40 by 100. Uh -huh. And those were usually shops, you know, doing the heavy equipment repair or re retreads on tires and things like that. So that's pretty much the evolution of the Quonset And they were all originally first started and designed and tested here. And the first factory for manufacturing was actually built here for the war. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. We're having a great time talking about CBs, how we came about. I was proud to be CB from 1971 to 1975. Jack, how, how long were you? Uh, 20 years, 1974 to 94. And being a warrant officer, that's really high up. <laughs> to me, that more than an officer, more than listen men, you're in your own sphere in a way because you're very respected, aren't you? Yes I, yes, I guess we're kind of the technician. You know, uh, you've maxed out on your trade, you know a little bit about all the trades, and you have the experience of managing personnel. So you kind of sit there in that area. Of, I guess it's a little bit of a no man's land too because you're the warrant officer, so the chief's kind of kicked you out of the chief's mess, and I don't know how happy the officers are to have you in the <laughs> officer's mess, but anyway, I have no regrets. Uh, it was a fantastic tour, and um, I really enjoyed it. Now, as a chief, we all know this, you had a coffee cup, nobody ever washed it, right? <laughs> that's right, that's right. But it depends on what kind of chief you were. I would put, I would put milk in my coffee, but anyway. <laughs> it's always fun. Well, let's take a little look around here. Sure, sure. Perfect. Okay, that's another story we give for the museum here. Okay. So what happens during World War II is that while the construction is going on, Captain Miller has a set of plans that they brought back from England during the First World War called the British Nissen Hunt. He takes these plans and he gives them to the George A. Fuller Company. He says, I need you to take these plans and make some improvements on them, and I need you to bring this back to me within 30 days. So George A. Fuller takes those plans, makes the changes to it, brings them back to Captain Miller ahead of schedule. So now they start developing and manufacturing the Quonset huts here. The first huts are made out of uh, arches of about a quarter inch thick steel and they're shaped like a T. Mm -hmm. And the ends of the hut kind of hook on with eye hooks that hold the ends of the hut on and the rest of it's all held together with wooden purlings down the side. So it's very heavy. So that's the first model hut. It's 16 feet wide by 36 feet long. Okay, so us six footers are kind of tough. A little bit of hunchback trying to stand in there. So it's completely semicircular. Mm -hmm. So as that's going on, Captain Miller is given credit for naming them Quonset Huts after the base he's building at Quonset Point because he doesn't want to have copyright infringements with Great Britain and the Nissen Huts. So that's how they get their name, Quonset Huts. So there are multiple evolutions of the designs. Mm -hmm. The second hut now goes to a new shaped um, sheet metal channel type arch, mm -hmm. which is a lot lighter. Yes. And instead of being semicircular, now they go to a four foot vertical knee wall and then a semicircular top. Mm -hmm. And it's still 16 by 36 feet. The third design is now 20 by 40, but it now still has the four foot vertical knee wall and the curved top. Mm -hmm. And then now the third generation of hut is completely semicircular because they realize now with 20 by 40 feet, which is the new dimension, you don't have to have the knee wall on it because with being 20 feet wide there's plenty of room to stand up at the side of the hut. And then the final hut is still 20 by 40 but they take the corrugation they put it on horizontally so you don't have to have a bend or a curvature in the corrugation. Hmm. Okay. So these are all the evolutions and we have all of those huts on display outside except for the first model hut which we do have a complete hut but it's in storage we just haven't put one together. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, it would take eight men one day to completely assemble a hut. There were 83 interior floor plans for these huts. So one hut could be a barracks, the dentist's office, the doctor's office, the cobbler's shop, uh, the bakery, um, you name it, the chow hall, everything, uh, you name yeah. it. There was also a larger one called an elephant hut, which was 40 by 100. Uh -huh. And those were usually shops, you know, doing the heavy equipment repair or re retreads on tires and things like that. So that's pretty much the evolution of the Quonset huts. And they were all originally first started and designed and tested here. And the first factory for manufacturing was actually built here for the war. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. Yeah. We're having a great time talking about CBs, how we came about. I was proud to be CB from 1971 to 1975. Jack, how, how long were you? Uh, 20 years, 1974 to 94. And being a warrant officer, that's really high up. <laughs> to me, that more than an officer, more than listen men, you're in your own sphere in a way because you're very respected, aren't you? 
what yes, else? I, is? Yes, I guess we're kind of the technician. You know, uh, you've maxed out on your trade, you know a little bit about all the trades, and you have the experience of managing personnel. So you kind of sit there in that area. Of, I guess it's a little bit of a no man's land too because you're the warrant officer, so the chiefs kind of kicked you out of the chief's mess, and I don't know how happy the officers are to have you in the <laughs> officer's mess, but anyway, I have no regrets. Uh, it was a fantastic tour, and um, I really enjoyed it. Now, as a chief, we all know this, you had a coffee cup, nobody ever washed it, right? <laughs> that's right, that's right. But it depends on what kind of chief you were. I would put, I would put milk in my coffee, but anyway. You know. It's always fun. Well, let's take a little look around here. Sure, sure. Map of the entire facilities here of Quonset Naval Air Station and the Naval Construction Battalion Center. There were over 3,500 acres here between the two bases. The area that's outlined in the yellow was basically the property that belonged to uh, Davisville, the Naval Construction Battalion Center. So you had the port down here, which was actually built during World War II as the advanced base depot with a shipload of material out to Great Britain. Um, but if you're looking here now, you all, this is where a lot of the Antarctic support left from, okay, building 18 down here on the pier. Um, then you have your supply area. This here was the construction equipment department. When I got here in 1989, I was a construction equipment officer, so I worked out of here. This is where we preserved and tested all the construction equipment before it was put away into uh, preservation for uh, pre-position war reserve stock. Mm -hmm. Then you had the disaster recovery village for all the training prior to the guys going to Vietnam or chemical biological warfare. 21st Naval Construction Regiment, this was supplied, but this row of Quonset huts was originally Camp Endicott during World War II. The CED area was actually um, Camp Thomas, which was the advanced base receiving barracks. There was over 500 Quonset huts here during World War II. So when they went to training at Camp Endicott, they were then transferred to Camp Thomas until there was a thousand men. Then they were commissioned as a battalion and then deployed. Then battalions coming back from overseas would report to Camp Thomas, and then they would either be broken up or go to training or retrofitted and then sent back out. Um, this was Antarctic Support, Construction Battalion Center, and CB Lant was up here in the admin, what we call the admin triangle. This was also NAVSCON, the Naval School Command up in this area. This is pretty unique, very important during World War II. This was the um, Advanced Base Proving Ground. This is where they tested and trained with all the pontoons for all the beach, beach invasions during World War II. And then I was talking to you about uh, the factory. The factory that built all the quantum huts was over here. This is called GSA, which is General Services Administration, which was the supply. But this was the factory site where all the quantum huts were made during the Second World War. Camp Fogarty was Sun Valley. That's where they did all their military training during World War II. And it was called Camp Fogarty because there was a congressman by the name of John Fogarty who gave up his congressional seat during the Second World War, enlisted into the Seabees, fought and served in the Pacific Theater. And then after the war came back home, went back into Congress and went and fought for the rights and the conditions of the enlisted men after serving in World War II. We were lucky to have them. Yeah, so that's why the base was changed back to uh, the name of Camp, um, Camp Fogarty. Wasn't there a barge landing area that he developed? Uh, there was actually, if you look on this photo, so there's a straight deck aircraft carrier, there's an LST, and then there is a landing ramp right here where the LSTs would pull up. And then, of course, the Quonset Needle Air Station, the, the hospital. This is the seaplane hangar. I'm sorry, this is the uh, carrier based hangar this side, and this is the seaplane hangar. So there are three ramps here where the seaplanes used to land and come up ashore during the Second World War. It's a great map. And then uh, <laughs> the good CB that I was, I managed to get a hold of these other blown up photos from the 1940s, which go into detail of uh, what some of the warehouse areas are. And what we need to do is just put little numbers on these and then correspond it to the big map so people will understand what's been enlarged so they have a better detail of what happened. So what do we have here, Jack? So we have the uniform of Frank I. Afraidy. We, as we mentioned earlier in, in our discussion that Frank was the plan file clerk here at the base during World War II and then designed the CB logo. Frank later on joins the CBs during the Second World War, becomes a carpenter's mate during the Second World War, and then eventually becomes a chief petty officer. And so this is his khaki uniform, his CB combat boots, his work uniform. We have a picture in here of Frank with his original painting of the CB logo and with another young officer down below who with a recruiting poster. Uh, pistol belt canteen, first aid kit, one of his sea bags. And these were all donated by the Iafrady family uh, to the museum. What did Disney think about the CB? 
Every, every, but everybody thinks that Disney designed the CB logo. Disney did not design the logo. We all know, all of us CB veterans know that it was Frank Iafredi. However, Disney did design a couple logos, and he did design some for maybe a couple specific battalions, okay? And Disney did design the Phoebe logo, the female or the girlfriend logo of the CB, but Disney did not design the logo of the CB itself, okay? Disney also designed a lot of other naval aviation type logos, but not the original CB logo. I've so, never heard of the Phoebe's. Yes, yes, yes. There's, there's a girl with fancy shoes and a purse and lipstick and all that. I've never and, seen one. Yes, uh, and he <laughs> had something to do with that. So, Avi yeah, Darren. Yeah. And there's another, there's another logo that came out for the 25th anniversary of the Seabees, and it's a CB in a dress blue uniform. And he's got the jumper on top on with the flap in the back. And what happened was the Navy approached Frank Iafredi in 1967 for the 25th anniversary, and they asked Frank to change the logo, and he refused to. So the Navy went to a civilian advertising firm, and they're the ones that changed that logo to the dress blue uniform with the CB wearing that for the 25th anniversary in 1967. And that's a little bit of trivia that a lot of people don't know. I've never even seen it. Yeah. It's been forgotten. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so this uniform here is out of my personal collection. I've been a military collector for over 40 years. This is the uniform of Captain Raymond V. Miller, who we mentioned earlier was the officer, the public works officer at Newport that came across the bay and built this base. I bought this uniform on eBay about eight years ago. And I had it in my collection for two or three years, and I looked inside in the pocket, and there was the name R. V. Miller. I wrote to the museum in California, they sent me the entire dossier on him, and that's how I found out who he was, what he did, and now his uniform is returned back home to the base he built. Wonderful job. Yes. <laughs> this, is Coombs. this is Rear Admiral Lewis B. Coombs' uniform. He was the number two man to Ben Morale. Okay, so he helped form the CBs, get everything in action. He was in charge of all of the construction for all the bases during World War II. But he was also the advisor to the movie of the Fighting Seabees and very close friends of John Wayne. So up on the top we have a picture of him with John Wayne and there's a smaller one down here. So it's kind of a unique uniform to have in our small little museum and our collection is the number two man with the Seabees right here. Do you have Admiral Morales? No, oh. but no. That's all in California, unfortunately. This came to us from Troy, New York, the Historical Society, because that's where he was from. Ah. And they sent it to us. Marine Pioneer Regiment is basically the engineer group in a CB, in a, I'm sorry, in a Marine Corps division, okay? So they could be like the equivalent of the CBs or the Army Engineers, okay? So they didn't have enough of them in the Pacific Theater during World War II. So they had an agreement between the Navy CBs and the Marine Corps that they took five CB battalions during World War II and transferred them into the Marine Corps. They took all their Navy uniforms away from them and issued them all Marine Corps uniforms. So, they would wear the Marine Corps greens, but they would have Navy rating badges on them. We have a couple sets here, which these are very scarce uniforms to find because there's only the five battalions that did that. Um, we had a member of our CB veterans group that passed away maybe four or five years ago. He lived to be, uh, I think, 99, 100 years old. He was assigned to the 4th Marine Division that made the landings at Roy Numir, Saipan, and Tinian during the Second World War. And uh, he was 32 years old, I think, when he was in that unit. So he started out in the 19th Battalion, was assigned to the 4th Marine Division, and went back to the 121st Battalion. But he tells a funny story where he's on the beach, either at Saipan or Tinian, and they're fighting away with the Japanese, and two young 18-year-old Marines jump in this foxhole, and here's this old guy turns around and looks at him, and they're firing away, and he goes, hey, Pop, what the hell are you doing here? And he goes, shut up and keep shooting, I'm in your damn outfit. And it was a funny story he used to tell. <laughs> and a lot, of, a lot of people don't know that, that uh -huh. we had CBs wearing Marine Corps uniforms during the Second World War. Didn't know that. Another fact was the 133rd Battalion was on the landing of Iwo Jima and took something like 70% casualties during the Second World War because they went ashore in the first wave with the Marines during World War II. CBs were always there first. <laughs> that's, that's our claim. <laughs> always. Yeah. And I always liked that idea of being in, in the forefront of it all because we can do, as they always that's say. It, that's right. Where did that come from, can do? 
there's, there's all kinds of sayings that come along with our outfit. You know, the impossible we can do, a miracle takes a little longer. Um, hammer to size, paint to fit, and file to hide. Hammer to size, file to fit, paint to hide. These were all models that the CBs had. <laughs> and I just think that there was something that, whatever the mission that was given to a CB, you knew that you could rely upon it getting done. I think Douglas MacArthur said the only thing that's wrong with the CBs is we don't have enough of them during the Second World War. So, I mean, you can go on and on and on with all these little antidotes and, and all that stuff, but I just think that that, that was the motto, can do. You got a project for us, we're gonna get it done. And I, I like what you said about the Marines because whenever I talk to someone else as a Marine, they, I say I'm a CB and they go, we used to work with you. That's right. That's right. Always. Right. And we can't always fight them all over. You know? <laughs> <laughs> we try it. <laughs> I think during World War II they took CBs from the age of 19 to I think it was up to 50 years old. The average age of a CB during World War II was 37 years old. They knew that CBs also snick, stuck in up to 60 years old. But there used to be an old saying during World War II, never hit a CB because you could be a Marine's dad. This recruiting poster is build and fight in the Navy CBs, wanted construction workers. Was it hard to get construction workers back then? Uh, so what I can tell you is that what happened is when they first started recruiting them, this is Frank's original painting, and this is one of the original recruiting posters that they started using. So they went to all of the major construction sites during World War II and started pulling in all the skilled craftsmen. Well, that went on for about a year and a year and a half until the union started complaining that you're taking all of our skilled craftsmen away from all of our construction jobs, so you need to stop. So then, that's why Camp Endicott was built, because now they had to start taking men out of Navy boot camp, bringing them here to Camp Endicott to teach them their trade, and then assign them to our own battalion. So that's how Camp Endicott came about, and training our own sailors to become CBs and stop taking them off of the trades out of the unions and out of the big construction projects in the United States. Notice on top of the display cases, we have all these little wooden boxes. Well, these are all handmade suitcases. And we used to get these all over the place and they'd be donated. So this one here from DJ Federico, 63rd Battalion, was brought to us by someone who lived in the city of Cranston here in Rhode Island. And that was thrown out on junk day. Somebody saw it brought it to us, we popped open the lock, and his dress blue uniform was still inside with all of his ribbons. And it's a shame, stuff like that ends up on the curb. So we had no historical type data about these boxes until one day we get hundreds and hundreds of photos, and we just need to try and catalog them and scan them and so we can put them on display and have people look at them. So one day I'm going through this photo album and I find one of the old black and white photos that's like three by four inches. So I take it and I enlarge it, and if you look, there's a bunch of CBs going up a gangway on a ship, and what are they carrying in their hands? I see. All these homemade little I see. suitcases. So now we put together photographic evidence of the little suitcases being made during the Second World War. And some of the, some of the hand painting that was done on these is just absolutely amazing, the craftsmanship that they had during the war. My experience here as the curator and talking to veterans that come in and, and their families, it's very rewarding. Um, on several occasions, I've gotten to speak, in, speak to some of the Vietnam era veterans. And a lot of them really don't discuss their experiences with their families or, or talk much about it. Um, so on several occasions, I've gotten to speak to some veterans personally, one-on-one, -on -one, walking through the museum and discussing things and asking them questions and they would open up and say things. And I think later on that they would eventually be outside talking with their wives and things like that and maybe opening up a little bit more. Their wives would be standing in the background and hearing a little bit more of what was going on. So then later the, the wives would kind of come up to me and thank me for speaking with their husbands and actually having them open up because they'd never opened up in those 60 something years after the war. And they were very grateful that they finally opened up, they finally spoke about what they experienced, where they had been, what they had done, what they had seen. So that's very rewarding to me that I was able to get them to open up and speak about it. So it's, it's very positive for me, I enjoy it. This is my passion here, giving these tours, setting up all these displays, and it's just, it's rewarding.